Muhammad and his community were dejected by their defeat at Uhud, and the Prophet desperately needed a way to rejuvenate and re-inspire the Muslim community. An opportunity for this occurred during a meeting with the leaders of the Jewish Nadir tribe, when Muhammad was suddenly warned by Jibrail that some of the Jews were plotting against him. In response to this, Muhammad besieged the entire Nadir tribe, who remained defiant until the Prophet began to destroy their precious orchards, whereupon they accepted defeat and entered into negotiations. They were allowed to leave Medina alive and did so with style, departing for their lands at Khaybar in the north in a great procession. They paraded through Medina amid music, whilst the Nadir women flaunted their legendary beauty and taunted their aggressors. The defeat of the Nadir gave Muhammad and the Muslim community new lands and wealth, as well as securing and strengthening the Prophet's control over Medina. In 627 CE, the enemies of Muhammad decided to put an end to him once and for all, and a massive confederation of Meccan Quraysh, Central Arabian Bedouins, and Khaybar Jews was assembled. The Prophet caught wind of this great host, however, and was able to prepare for their coming. The city of Medina was heavily fortified and surrounded by a giant trench, a concept originating from one of Muhammad's Persian followers, that proved to be extremely successful against the Confederate army. After two weeks of fruitless siege, during which secret converts to Islam amid the Confederates spread discord and confusion, a great storm passed through the region and the enemies of Muhammad were forced to retreat back to Mecca. As with the triumph at Badia, this great victory was seen as a sign from God and evidence for the ascendancy of Muhammad and Islam. After the Confederate army retreated, Muhammad and his followers turned on the last Jewish tribe in Medina, the Quraysa, who were accused by the Prophet and God, via a timely revelation from Jibrail, of treachery. The Quraysa had in fact not moved against Muhammad, and indeed had supported him in the preparations for the siege by assisting in the creation of the all-important trench. God, via Jibrail, via Muhammad, had spoken, however, and with this incentive, the Muslims of Medina besieged the Quraysa tribe. The Jews held out for nearly a month, but defeat was inevitable, and they soon gave in. Unlike the previous attacks on the Kanuka tribe and the Nadir tribe, however, the Quraysa tribe was not allowed to go free, and instead they had their fate decided in the following manner. Just as the Arab Khazraj tribe had pleaded clemency for the Kanuka Jews, so too did the Ors Arab tribe plead clemency for the Quraysa Jews, who had been their allies. Muhammad compromised and allowed a member of the Ors tribe to decide the fate of the Jews, but the man selected was a devout follower of the Prophet. He ruled that the men of Quraysa should be put to death, and the women and children be enslaved and given over to the Muslims. Muhammad received a timely communique from God confirming this to be the best course of action, and all of those male Quraysa with pubic hair were promptly executed and dumped into a ditch whilst those without pubic hair and all females were enslaved. Muhammad himself took one of the women named Rehana bin Zaid as a concubine. The remaining Jews of Medina, who had not been part of the Kanuka, the Nadir, or the Quraysa, were eventually forced to leave Medina, and thus Muhammad had his revenge on those whose criticisms and mockery had cut the deepest. In 627 CE, 
Muhammad married his cousin Zainab bin Jahish. Zainab had been married to Muhammad's adopted son, Zaid ibn Harith. But when Muhammad visited their house one day, he was greeted by Zainab, who was half naked. Muhammad was taken by her beauty, a fact which Zaid noted. So to please the Prophet and make his wife available for him, Zaid divorced Zainab. For Muhammad to marry his adopted son's wife was a violation of Arabian custom. But Jibreel appeared and revealed that the Prophet had a dispensation from God to do exactly that. Zainab was Muhammad's fifth living wife, after Aisha, Sauda, Hafsa, and Hind bint Abi Umayyah, a widow the Prophet had married after the Battle of Ahud. According to Jibreel's previous divine dictations, only four wives were allowed per husband, but fortunately for Muhammad, he was given a special dispensation from God that exempted him from such limitations. After the Battle of the Trench and the massacre of the Khoreza Jews, Muhammad had a dream of returning to Mecca to perform the old Hunafa ritual of pilgrimage to the Kaaba. Taking his dream to be a portent from God, he and his followers travelled to Mecca where a forewarned Qurayshi army awaited them. Instead of falling to bloodshed, however, Muhammad and the Quraysh honoured the sanctity of the Kaaba. According to Arab custom, there was to be no fighting within the vicinity of the Kaaba, and by extension, Mecca. An accord was reached, known as the Treaty of Hudbiyah, which declared a cessation of violence between Mecca and Medina for the next decade, and also allowed for the return of the Muslims the following year to perform a pilgrimage. Muhammad returned to Medina without having completed his original goal, to perform the pilgrimage, but he had secured peace and security for his community. Muhammad and his followers were disappointed that they had been temporarily denied access to the Kaaba. So to lift their spirits and keep morale running high, the Prophet set his eyes on the last great Jewish stronghold, Khaybar, which was seen as a bastion of anti-Islamic sedition and treachery. Muhammad sent a delegation to the Jews, inviting their leaders to come meet him and broker a peace deal. This seems to have been nothing more than a devious ploy, however, and on the way to Medina, the Jewish delegation was murdered in cold blood. Muhammad didn't attack Khaybar immediately, however, and waited until the Jews again had their guard down before launching a full-scale attack. He positioned his men at night and struck during the morning, when the people of Khaybar were getting ready for work in their fields and orchards. Muhammad's armies besieged and conquered the fortresses of Khaybar, murdering all of the men and distributing the women and children amongst the Muslims. Some of the Jews put up a fierce resistance, however, and after a lengthy siege, were able to secure the following concordat. In exchange for their lives and continued labour on their lands, which were now owned by Muslims, the Jews would pay Muhammad a special jizya tax or tribute a system that the Prophet later adopted for all Jews and Christians under his rule. Whilst in Khaybar, Muhammad was nearly assassinated when he was given some poisoned lamb to eat. Fortunately for him, he ate only a little bit of the dire food and became ill, although one of his companions wasn't so lucky and died. Of the many Jews who were taken captive, Muhammad laid claim to a beautiful Jewess by the name of Safiya bin Tuye to be his wife taking her from one of his followers. Safiya's husband, Kinana ibn al-Rabbi, was a leader of the Khaybar Jews, who Muhammad had tortured by means of a fire lit on the man's chest, in order to extract from him the location of the hidden wealth of the Nadia tribe. The Jew refused despite this torment, however, and was subsequently beheaded. A 
A year after the treaty at Hudbiya, Muhammad and his followers returned to Mecca to perform a pilgrimage, as per the Hudbiya agreement. Bilal ibn Rabah, the Abyssinian ex-slave and first muezzin, gave the call to prayer from atop the Kaaba, as the believers venerated the sacred site. The Meccans were unhappy about this, and stated they're ready for any foul play throughout the pilgrimage, but honoured their agreement until the Muslims completed their rituals and returned to Medina. In 629 CE, Muhammad sent letters and emissaries to the Caesar of the Byzantine Empire, the Byzantine governor of Egypt, the Byzantine governor of Syria, the Negus of Abyssinia, the Persian governor of Yemen, the Persian governor of Oman, the Persian governor of Bahrain, and the Shah of Persia, inviting these heads of state and statesmen to convert to Islam. When the Shah received his letter, according to Islamic tradition, he was deeply offended and promptly responded by asking his viceroy in Yemen, a Persian vassal, to deal with the Prophet. Fortunately for Muhammad, the Shah was murdered by his son before any action was taken against him, and the governor of Yemen, seeing this as providence, converted to Islam. The Caesar of the Byzantines, according to Islamic tradition, acknowledged the truth of Muhammad's claims, but this is a doubtful episode and was probably a Muslim interpolation. The Caesar was focused on intrigues with Persia and took no heed of Muhammad's request. The governor of Egypt, who was autonomous from the Byzantines at that point, responded favourably and courteously sent Muhammad gifts, most notably two Coptic slave girls. Muhammad was infatuated by one of them in particular, Maria el Kibtia, and made her his concubine. Maria would later bear him a son, although the infant soon became ill and died. By Islamic accounts, the Negus of Abyssinia also converted to Islam upon receiving his letter, but this is highly doubtful and lacks historical credence. The letter to the Byzantine governor of Syria never reached its destination, however, as the Muslim emissaries carrying the letter were captured and murdered by the Ghassanid Arabs of northern Arabia. When Muhammad's emissary to Syria was murdered by the Ghassanid Arabs, he sent a large Muslim army to seek revenge. Unfortunately for the Prophet, Ghassan was a proxy state of the Byzantine Empire, and when his expeditionary retaliation force entered the Levant, they stumbled across the Byzantine military. Believing themselves capable of defeating a larger army, as they had done in the Battle of Badia, the Muslims attacked the Byzantines near a village called Muta, a foolhardy assault that led to disaster. The Byzantine army had received prior warning of their approach, and in the ensuing conflict, one Muslim commander after another was slain in quick succession, including the Prophet's adopted son, Zayd ibn Harith, before Muhammad's proud army fled in disgrace. It was only through the efforts of the brilliant Muslim tactician Khalid ibn al-Walid that the Muslim army was able to hold together and retreat in an orderly fashion back to Medina, humiliated and cowed by the Byzantines.